second one? Okay. I'm going to leave this here then. Marty, you want to go ahead and start the music, and we'll start the broadcast.
do the get the gather music first rather than me. Okay. Good morning. Welcome today on our homecoming Sunday. Let us stand and sing our song of our gathering music, please. Your words will be on the screen for you. I hope. I sing praises to your name. Be patient here and aging glasses don't go together, especially when you add a mass. Well, good morning, and I welcome each of you here to our homecoming service today. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, I want to... Uh, Introduce Eddie, uh, sorry, say Eddie Evans. We've got another Pastor Eddie here. Eddie Williams is with us today, and we're honored to have him. Uh, he was here, or his dad was here in 1957. Uh, so any of you my age and older probably remember him and his family. I do have some announcements, and I'd like to start off. Uh, it's with heavy heart, again, that I offer our condolences to the family of Charles Kepley. Uh, Vicki passed away Friday evening. Services will be Tuesday. Uh, visitation is from 10 to 11 here, and then the service begins at 11. Pastor Mitch wanted to announce that this afternoon is when we have the baptism by immersion down at High Rock Lake, and it begins at 4 o'clock. Uh, you can get more details uh, from your bulletin. Uh, nominating committee will meet this coming Monday. We're going to start at 3.30 from here. If anybody okay, be here at 3.30 if you want to be immersed or go watch this. Carpool, carpool, carpool. And you're going to carpool from here at 3.30. Uh, nominating committee will meet at uh, 6.30 here Monday evening, and that will be uh, followed at 7 o'clock by a meeting of the trustees. Uh, we have All Seasons Consignment Sale, which is sponsored by American Heritage Girls. That begins October 2nd and October 3rd. If you'd like to donate any items, uh, you can bring them here to the church. There's also the Sisters Helping Sisters Ladies Banquet, which is going to be Saturday, October 24th. If you'd like to sponsor a table or get a ticket to attend, please contact uh, Kay Hedrick or Linda Leonard. Are there any other announcements this morning? Okay, I'd like to pray for us. Let's bow our head. Dear God, we humble ourselves to you this morning, and we give praise to your holy name. We ask for grace and mercy and for healing for our sick and hurting families. We ask for comfort as we celebrate the lives and memories of our deceased members during this homecoming Sunday. I also pray for our America. I pray for peace, but in a different way. Uh, Attaining peace is easy, and one only needs to surrender, but we must only surrender to our God. I love our church family, and I always feel comfortable here, and I know it's because we have all surrendered our lives to Christ. And that does not mean that we surrender to Satan and to the evils of this world. We must all be unafraid and be courageous. 
Uh, as you've told us in the Bible, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And also in conjunction with that, in John 16, 33, it says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribul tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let us pray for a victory over our world, God. We are beyond afraid, and we know the ending of the story. Let us celebrate our victory in Jesus, our Savior forever. Amen. And welcome to Center. Let us stand and sing our opening hymn, We Are the Church. And I felt like this was such an appropriate song to sing on our homecoming Sunday because it says in the first verse, the church is not a steeple, it's not a resting place, uh, it's not just a building, but the church is the people. And Eddie mentioned in the early service this morning that he was here, his family, his father was a minister here in 1957, and he asked for anyone to respond by blowing their horn if they were here and remembered them. I was the only horn in the whole parking lot that beeped. But, so I have a strong tie here, and I'm grateful for that. So let us stand and sing We Are the Church. Good morning. Good morning. There's a lot of people out here today. Y'all can be louder than that. Good morning. Good morning. Much better, much better. Before I get started this morning, I do have a couple announcements. Sorry, Richard. Um, the American Heritage Girls is having a fundraiser this year. We are selling butter braids. So they are very delicious. So if you guys want to order some, just see one of the troop members and they're $15 a piece, and they'll be in in time for Thanksgiving. We are also having our annual consignment sale, biannual, excuse me, um, this coming up weekend. So if you still have donations that you want to send me, I can come up here and meet you anytime this week. We're accepting donations until Wednesday. All right, so boys and girls, our scripture today comes from Revelation 21, 1 through 4. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. So with that Bible verse today, so what do you guys think of when you hear the word homecoming? It's a very special day. So what's homecoming to you guys? You say food. <laughs> Sorry. What else do you think of when you think of homecoming? Singing. Family. There you go. That's one of mine. Family reunions. How about this one? What about when soldiers come home from war? That's a homecoming. That's a great homecoming. A lot of homecomings are church get-togethers that are held every year. What? Football games. There you go. Homecoming at football. Woo! So, but the word homecoming probably means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But today I want to share with you a story that I really enjoy. It comes from the book, Heaven is for Real. Have you guys ever read this book or watched the movie? Raise your hand if you have. A lot of you have. For those who have not, it, this book is based on a true story. It's about a young boy, and his name is Colton Burpo. When he was almost four years old, God let him experience a very special treat for almost two hours. Kind of weird, huh? Let's, let's, let's figure out what that treat is. So he got really sick, and when he got sick, he had an appendicitis, and he went into the hospital, and he actually died on the table. And he had died for two hours. They thought he was dead. But guess what happened? God gave his family and Colton a special gift. He brought him back after being dead. So while Colton was laying there, he actually experienced lots of great things. God gave him a special treat by allowing him to experience what heaven's like. While he was in heaven, he got to meet a few special people. He got to meet a grandfather or a great-grandfather that had passed away when his daddy was a little boy. He had never met him before. He actually got to meet his little sister. Now, he, had a little, he has a little sister that's living, that plays with him every day, but he got to meet the little sister who was never born, who his mother never talked about. So he got to see who she was. So all these things, and he got to see all the beautiful surroundings around him. But the greatest gift of all was Colton actually got to meet Jesus. Now, what excitement is that to actually meet the Lord? He shares his story in this book, and today, we're gonna, when we go downstairs, boys and girls, we're going to watch a little bit of this movie and talk more about Colton and his story. And I encourage each one of you guys to go either watch the movie or read the story. It's really encouraging. So if you believe in Jesus, and if you've ever become afraid of dying, some people are scared of death, or if you ever get sad that someone passed away. But just remember, there is going to be a homecoming, and we will see them again. So be encouraged by that. And just remember that Colton actually experienced that. So heaven is actually real. So best bow your heads and close your eyes and say our prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing Colton to experience heaven for just a few minutes so that he could come back and share with what he saw with others. Help us to use his testimony and testimony you give us in your world, in your word, to never be afraid of dying, as long as we put our trust in you, Lord. Please help and encourage those who have lost loved ones today. We know that we will see them again, and we know that you're going to be with us each and every day. Please keep us safe as we go about this next week and help us do the best that we can. In your holy name we pray, and all the kids say, Amen. 
All right, if you guys want to meet me in the back, we'll go downstairs. Thank you, Angie. That's a good transition to this part of our service of remembrance. And this is so important for the families, particularly this year of all years, because the, the way the worship times for, for funerals have been so different, and, and many of them have been gravesides, and uh, it's just been a tough time. Uh, and uh, so we're thankful to have all the families here, and know that just know that your loved ones were very precious to this this church family, and uh, their legacy lives on. Hear the word of the Lord. It's found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Before I begin reading the names of our members who have passed on to be with their Lord and Savior, I would like to thank you all for being here today. From experience, the passing of a loved one can still be a very tender time, and for some of you, an extremely recent passing. I thank you for remembering your family member today with your presence and your precious words of remembrance. With our current situation, we will be handling this part of our homecoming service a little different than usual. As your family member's name is called, please stand and remain standing while the candle is being lit and words are read. Um, Robert will bring, bring a rose where you will be standing, and I'd also like to thank Camille for helping with the lighting of the candle today and for Molly Long. Donald Reed Grubb. Don was a lifelong member of Center. Each Sunday, you would find him sitting on the third row pew. He was a member of the Friendship Sunday School class. Don was active in the Welcome Fire Department and the Welcome Lions Club. Zella Marie Bates Mentor, better known as Kitty. Kitty loved her family, church, and friends. She loved animals, cooking, spending time with people, and making things. She loved her crafts. Kitty loved sharing the things she made, bears, bells, angels, and so much more with her friend, dear friends and community. She was a true friend. Kitty would listen to anyone and let them talk about what worried or bothered them. She was quick to offer a meal or support to anyone in need. Kitty always supported efforts to donate to those less fortunate through the church and the Goodwill class. Helping others was a focus in her life that she passed on to her children as an important life lesson. Kitty is missed terribly by her husband, daughters, grandchildren, and so many friends. Frances Jane Kroll Kiger. Frances passed away unexpectedly on February 15th and left behind her soulmate, Leroy, of 58 years, two daughters, Jamie and Marla, five grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. She was a member of the friendship class. Frances loved spending time with her family at their beach home, as well as watching movies, reading books, and cheering for the wolf pack. She was known for her excellent cooking skills, as was shown on any given Sunday at lunch by the number of cars in her driveway. Frances will always be remembered and loved by her family and friends. Dorothy Louise Zimmerman Craver. This is written by her son, Mike. Mom was a member of the Friendship Sunday School class in United Methodist Women. Mom loved her church and all her special friends at Center Church. She missed being here when her health started to fail, but always kept up with what was going on. She was able to be at most of the drive-in services up to her passing and cherished seeing all of your smiling faces. 
Mom truly lived the example of putting others before herself. We miss her, but look forward to seeing her again in heaven. Arvel Landon Sink. Lanny, as we knew him best, was a member of the Friendship Sunday School class. He was a happy man. He was the friendliest and warmest person in the world. Many times we watched him chat with complete strangers while we waited, not always so patiently, to leave a restaurant, ball game, or almost any place we would go. Usually he made some sort of connection with that person. He made friends everywhere that he went, and he could expect to be greeted with one of, and you could expect to be greeted with one of his big hugs every time you met. Lanny loved his family, his church family and friends, but most of all, he loved Jesus. He was a thankful man and began each day by thanking God for another day of life and for his health. Never once did he question why his health was so poor. He was content whatever his circumstance. He was quick to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. He was such a humble man. Lanny was not perfect, but he was perfect for our family. We were well loved and will always miss him. Jeffrey Hayes Laughlin. Jeff was born into Center United Methodist Church to Hoyt and Hilda Laughlin and was a member of the youth Sunday school class taught by Stowe Koontz. Therefore, he had a strong moral base that helped him to excel in all of life's endeavors. He had a loving wife of 49 years, Nancy, a son, Jeff II, a daughter, Jennifer, and a grandson, Hunter. Although he lived in Nevada, his heart belonged to North Carolina. He loved the people of this church and the North Davidson community, coming back to visit family and friends as often as possible. When he was a kid, he always loved homecomings. Chrissy and Nick's mom, Aunt Vay Leonard, would make the most delicious chest tarts, and Jeff would sneak and get as many as he could before the blessing was even said. He usually paid the price later at home. Jeff, the Laughlin and Leonard families love you and miss you and miss your wisdom and wit every day. Richard Eugene Mendenhall. Richard was a member of the Good Samaritan Sunday School class and enjoyed attending Picking and Grinning. When God made a farmer, he knew what he had in mind for Richard Mendenhall. Richard woke early, worked hard all day, and never knew what it was to not put in a full day's work. He was a provider for his wife, Sue, and children, Jeff, Kathy, and Stacy. He loved his family, his church, and his beloved cows. Richard didn't get to take a lot of vacations or do a lot of fun thing, family things, but his family knew how much he loved them through his dedication to his farm. He certainly loved his grandchildren as he and Sue cared for them all from very young ages. When it was time for him to slow down, rest, and enjoy his life, he was challenged with his hardest job of all. He spent his last few years caring for his precious Sue. He was by her side every single day, and now they are together again. Zona Gail Anderson Craver. This is written by her son, Joe. Mother was a member of the Friendship Class, United Methodist Women, Parsonage Committee, and Center Youth Leader. Mother was very energetic and full of faith. She enjoyed hosting guests at her home and at High Rock Lake. She could feed the masses and truly had a gift of hospitality. She and Dad loved traveling and seeing the world. Mother always had a smile on her face. Donald Edward Walser. Donald was a lifelong member of Center. He was a member of the Friendship Sunday School class. He was blessed with four children, seven grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. Toby Ann Leonard Fox. <clears throat> Toby was a member of the Friendship class. With her passing being so re recent, it was difficult for Bob to put into words what was on his heart. At a later date, he would like to speak to the congregation about his wife and her love for this church. Chrissy Sylvia Leonard Wagner. 
Chrissy was a member of the Good Samaritan class, United Methodist Women, and the choir. Chrissy was beloved wife, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. Her children are Britt Wagner and wife Audrey, Heather McCarn and husband Chris, Heidi Nifong and husband Kent. Her grandchildren are Ashton Miller and husband Cord and great-grandson Elliot, Jacob McCarn, Madison Wagner, Luke McCarn and wife Aubrey, and Nathan Nifong. She will be remembered for her quick wit and love for the Lord, her church, her friends, and her family. The family would like to thank the Good Samaritan Sunday School class and all those who sent meals, cards, visited, and prayed for the family over the past several years as Bob and Chrissy have both suffered a decline in health. The family is also so grateful to the caregivers for making it possible to keep Bob and Chrissy at home and who continue to care for Bob, Althea Harrison, Terry Kepley, Anna Schillinglaw, Beth Gallows, Catherine Bullings, and Danielle Schillinglaw. Chrissy knew how to light up a room when she walked in, and she will be dearly missed. At this time, we would like to remember the loved ones and friends of those in our church family who were not members of Center but have passed since our last homecoming celebration. As we light the community candle, I would ask you to stand and speak out the person's name and the relationship to you as we remember them at this time. Ron Guppy, brother. Ian Tuttle Thomas, co worker. We need to remember um, Vicki Kepley's family, Charles and Tim and the rest of them. And we need to remember Miss Bonnie Mentor as well, Charlie, Charles's, and we just need to remember them. Any others? Lift your hand if there's a need we have. I know there's two families in our church that... Uh, in need of a kidney, we need to remember uh, Randy Black's son as he awaits a kidney, and also Lynn Upchurch's family, they have a son in law that's in need of a kidney as well. We need to remember our missionaries as they're serving. This is a, we think this is a tough time for us. It's a very difficult time for them to be connected with the people they're trying to serve, so uh, we, we need to remember them. Some of you support other missionaries, but the church supports several I want to mention to you. Just remember the family we support in Southeast Asia. We can't name their name. We need to pray for them, their protection. We also want to remember the mentors as they're serving over in uh, Macedonia. We also want to remember, oh my goodness, our family down in Charleston. They just had a, a baby, by the way. Uh, Malloys, we will remember them. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we praise you for the day and for the blessings you've given to us. We're thankful, Father, that as we walk this old journey, that we step into the footprints of others who have gone before us. They have uh, taken the bush axe, Lord, of faith, and uh, they have made a pathway for us to be able to go through this wilderness of life. We thank you, Father, that while it may be dark, there are torch bearers that have lit the light of your love brightly, and we thank you. Father, we pray that you'd uh, continue to bless these families, give them comfort, 
We pray for these, Lord, that uh, are dealing with, with the freshness of death today, that you'd be with uh, the Kepleys, Lord, and hold them. We pray that you'd continue to be with Bob's family and help them as they continue, Lord, with their dad. And we pray, Father, that you'd be with uh, Charles' family as well. Be with them and strengthen them over these days that lie ahead. Thank you, Father, that your word says your grace is sufficient. We pray for your whisper of peace upon their lives. We pray as well for your Holy Spirit's empowerment upon our missionaries as they serve. Lord, I pray that you'd use them and that God, during these difficult times, those that they are entrusted with would see all the more the love that they have for you and the love they have for those that they've been placed to serve. Father, we ask for your help. We ask for forgiveness where we failed you. And we do pray for our country, O oh Father, in forgiveness. We pray that you would help us. We pray for revival to sweep our land. We pray for pastors to be bold as they proclaim the faith and pass it to their people, for Sunday school teachers, for small group leaders today. We pray that you would raise up new leaders in our midst. And God, we pray that you'd use us to be soul winners for you, to make a lasting difference. And we're going to thank you, Father, for all you do. We ask now that you'd bless the offering that we're about to receive, that it'd be used to transform your world and to make a difference for your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As our ushers come forward.
What a great day we've had thus far. We're honored to have Brother Eddie Williams with us with us this morning. He brought a briefcase full of stuff, and, I, and we do not have anything to eat. We may be here a while. What I'm honored about is when he asked how many remembered him last time he preached, I was thinking back when he rode the, his dad rode the, was a circuit riding preacher riding, and he rode along with him. He's so old. I thought that was funny. <laughs> Molly don't like that. Molly was in a carriage. Could we welcome Brother Eddie Williams with us this morning again? I need something to hold on to. That's how old I am. You know, I was going to say something nice about Mitch, but now I think I won't. I was going to tell you that, you know, after working with Christian organizations for 30, 40 years, and particularly in the field of evangelism, and I don't need this on up here, uh, I realized how hard my dad worked as a local pastor. Because as even Mr. Graham used to say, you know, all I've got to have is about 10 sermons in a car or an airplane or a train, and I just go from town to town and preach the same sermon. Okay. I need a green light on. Well, wait a minute. No, it's not either. No, it's not. How about now? No? How about if I use this one? <laughs> yeah. The funny thing about this is, I started my career in the YMCA, so I had to talk in a gym, at a camp, in a swimming pool with no acoustical tiling, so people to this day say, why do you talk so loud? I said, well, and I tell them that story. So the Lord blessed me with good vocal cords, and then for 15 years, I went from theater to theater with movies like Johnny, The Hiding Place. Any of you see those films, Johnny or The Hiding Place? Those were our two biggest. A couple of you have. but So in a theater, I'd have to introduce the film, so I'd go down front. Well, I didn't even have a mic. And so, again, I had to really be able to speak loud and project my voice, and so really probably don't even need that to make you here and and you know i congratulate you people for having this family life center i think that's the correct name for it i call them a gym but people in burlington at the y used to come up to me and say how come we don't have all these young people at our church i say because you spent all the money on the steeple instead of building a family life center i said if you had a family life center you'd have a lot more people participating in the church seven days a week instead of a couple of hours on Sunday and Wednesday night prayer meeting. So I think this is great. And I know one thing, I've eaten a lot of chicken pies because of this building. <laughs> and outside of Lexington Barbecue, I tell people, you know, you may never heard of Welcome, but you've heard of Lexington Barbecue. And if you go to Welcome, you get some of the best chicken pies in the world if you go to Center Methodist Church. So anyway, this is truly homecoming for me in a lot of ways. I was when Britt called and asked me a couple months ago if I'd do this, I said, Britt, I did this ten or twelve years ago. He said, You did? I said, Yes, I did. And I said, the second thing I was going to say, ask you is, well, do you know what I spoke on? Well, if he didn't even remember me being here, he always didn't remember what I talked about. <laughs> Britt, I'm just giving you a hard time. But I'm glad you don't remember because I can use the same thing. I don't have but one sermon anyway. And uh, it's not a sermon. If I'd had ever taken a course in homiletics like Mish had to to get out of school, I can guarantee you I would have never passed it. And, to, you know, because I do have the gift of gab, people constantly tell me, well, you should have been a preacher like your dad. You are a gifted person for being a preacher. And I said, well, one thing I know is you don't have the gift of discernment or you wouldn't have said that. I said, there's a vast difference in being a pastor teacher than being a salesman with a gift of gab. But, you know, my dad so faithfully told his four children, Jail and I were the oldest, and then Hannah and Judy, 
uh, four of us. Uh, I don't want any of you to follow in my footsteps unless you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's calling you to be a minister or pastor, missionary, whatever. But he said, I want you to find what God wants you to do and do it as one of his children. One of my favorite books is a book called Your Work Matters to God. And it just breaks my heart. Yesterday, I had a 30-year-old nurse call me from she, Richmond, Virginia. Mr. Williams, I want to do something for the kingdom of God. I'm a nurse. I'm 30 years old. I'm single. I can go anywhere in the world with World Medical Mission, with that big hospital, whatever. And I said, well, that's great, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But I said, you know, I've been in the hospital several times, and I'm so thankful for Christian doctors, nurses, whoever that took care of me. And I don't care what kind of vocation you're following to make your money to feed yourself and clothe yourself and send your kids to school. Your work matters to God. And if we did our work, well, Colossians 3.23 says we're to do everything as under the Lord, as if we were working for Jesus which we really are. Just think what a different world this would be. There's not enough preachers in the world to do what God's told us to do. It's our job. He's the shepherd. We're the sheep. And as sheep, we're supposed to bring other sheep into the fold. You never saw a, sure, a shepherd give birth to a sheep. That's the sheep's job. Then it's his job to disciple and train and equip us to do the work that whatever it is God's called us to do. So I hadn't planned to say that today, but anyway, that's why I am where I am today, because I never felt like I was supposed to do what my dad was doing, and I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And uh, I married, is my wife in here? Becky, are you here? She said, my sermon is so bad, she's sleeping in the motorhome. She, she's really, Becky still works that she would, she wouldn't tell you she's too nice. She says, he retired 10, 20 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago at 55. I still am working 40, 50 hours a week. And the reason is Franklin wanted me to retire, but he didn't want Becky to retire. In fact, he said, Ed, what are you going to do if you retire? I said, I'm going to get a motor home and I'm going to go to 63 national parks. My dad used to tell my mother, honey, when I retire from the Methodist pastorate, we're going to go camping in all the national parks. And my mother's response was, Clarence, I hope you never retire. All we ever did as a family for a vacation was camp because we didn't have money to do anything else. Well, we kids, we loved it, but, and we thought mother loved it. And one day after we were all married and we were at home sitting around the dining room, it was Thanksgiving actually, and we were at Burlington where JL was making his headquarters and so some people were dropped by to visit and uh, we got to talking about family vacations and so forth. And a couple of us kids said, well, you know what we did as a family, we camped all over every place and we just absolutely thought it was the greatest thing you could do. You learn a lot of responsibility and you made a close knit family and, and it's just a great thing for families to do. And this lady, the visitor, she looked at my mother and she said, Edith, did you go camping with these kids? She said for 30 years. And I said, and mother loved it. And then I waited for her to respond. She said, okay, y'all are all married. You got your own families. It's time for you to know the truth. I hated every minute of it. <laughs> she said, I did it because I love you, not camping. <laughs> well, when Becky and I got married, she's from the Amish country of Pennsylvania. She's a farm girl, so it's just not like she's never been outdoors. She can drive tractors and pull uh, hay balers and manure spreaders, and she won the, the state championship showing uh, pole Hereford. So, you know, she's a farm girl, but she they'd never been camping. And so when she married me, she was introduced to it rather rapidly. Well, well uh, for our 50th wedding anniversary, which was... Uh, Nine years ago, cannot believe we'll be celebrating our 60th coming up uh, this year. But anyway, for our 50th, she said, well, look, I, I, we travel all the time. Franklin had just given her a great big party for being there 40 years. And 
She said, I don't want to party. I don't want to travel. I don't want to go on a cruise. I said, well, you know something? In all of our travels, neither one of us have ever been to Key West, and I want to go. She said, well, we're not going camping. And I said, uh, are you sure? <laughs> she said, if you want to celebrate another wedding anniversary, we're not going camping. <laughs> so I, I knew my neighbor had a motor home for sale, and, and it was a nice one. And she said, I'll compromise with you. You go see if Jerry will loan you or rent you his motor home, and we'll do that. So, so that's what we did, and, and uh, that's why we're in our own motor home now. She said, you know, this is not too bad. I can handle this. So we're headed down to Pauly's Island to the state park there. We basically only camp at state and national parks. You read scripture a while ago about Revelation talking about over in the 21st chapter about heaven and new heaven and new earth. If you want to see where you're going to spend eternity, because i got news for you. All your friends and family that have died and gone to be with the Lord, they're with the Lord. But they're not in the permanent heaven. They're in the intermediate heaven. Now, don't ask me where that is. I wish I knew. But that's where they are until Jesus comes back and all those people get out of that cemetery out there. And then we will be in the permanent heaven, which is right here redone. God's going to do a redo. We go back to the Garden of Eden, and this is where we're going to spend eternity. So I say, if you want to know a little bit about what it's going to be like, go to a national park someplace on this earth where man is not messed it up, and you'll get an idea where you're going to spend eternity. And if you want the full story, get uh, Randy Alcorn's book, uh, Heaven, and do a Bible study of 500 pages of scripture is more in the Bible about heaven than you ever dreamed. And, and uh, so I encourage you to do that. In fact, I want to, before I get into something, I, I, a guy down in Houston, I'm not going to call his name, but he's always talking about, y'all just start your church service by doing something, by saying something funny. You know, you kind of know who I'm talking about. And he always has, I love his jokes, and then I go to another channel. I literally was walking in a cemetery in Wilmore, Kentucky, where Asbury College and Seminary is located, and I have a lot of family members that live there, and I got a lot of family members that are buried there. And my uncle said, I want to show you something. He takes me over this old tombstone, <clears throat> and he said, see if you can read that. And I had to get down on my knees and adjust my glasses, and here's what it said. Paul, stranger, when you pass me by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. Friend, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> now that was literally on a tombstone. That is on a tombstone in Wilmore, Kentucky. And so I'm doing commercials right now. My pastor, uh, David Seedman's, he was a missionary in India for 15 or 16 years, and the, the college and seminary asked him to come back from India to, for five years to pastor the Wilmore United Methodist Church. And um, I'm an avid reader. I used to put signs all over the YMCA when I was a YMCA director that said this, posters, the person that does not read is no better off than the person that cannot read. And I want to tell you something. If you want to grow in your faith, you either got to read, and basically I'm talking about, first of all, know the Word of God, and then all these good books that are available to read. If you don't like to read, you can get them now <clears throat> on audio and YouTube, so you don't have to actually read. In fact, uh, Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by, fill in the blank. Faith comes by hearing. And I often wondered, why didn't that say faith comes by reading? And then I was in uh, with my brother in some third world country, and nobody could read. And he said, do you understand now that God knew more people would always be able to hear than read? So that's why, and he said, now, I don't know that for sure, but he said, that's my opinion. Well, it made a lot of sense to me. So if you don't like to read, then listen to audio books, which I do while I'm driving I listen to them while I'm going to sleep at night. I have a 
tape recorder right by my bed, so I'm constantly taking stuff in my brain to help me to be more like Christ. And folks, in this day and age, well, let me just tell you what, what uh, has helped me in this area. Ask yourself at the end of the day, periodically, have I done as much Bible study as I have watched TV? And I, that started with me again back at the Y in Burlington one day. I skipped a church meeting, for, for the reason being I wanted to watch a football game. And so I didn't go to the church meeting. Well, my pastor called me the next day and wanted to know if I was sick. And I started to lie to him, but I said, no, I wasn't sick. There was a playoff game, and I stayed home and watched it. And he said, okay. And then when I got before God with my Bible open and my heart open, the Lord just basically through the Holy Spirit, the Lord doesn't speak to me audibly, but he speaks to me basically through his word. He said, Ed, what's the most important thing in your life? And I had to, to my, him and to myself say, well, it obviously isn't your kingdom and your work or your word or prayer. It's other things. So in order to change that, I said, Lord, if you will change my heart in this area and give me more of a desire for you and your kingdom, your word, It'll happen. But if you don't, my discipline will run out in two days. Because I tried a thousand times. For instance, one of the things that Billy Graham does is did, and I don't know whether he's still doing it in heaven or not. But there's 150 psalms. So how many psalms a day do you have to read in order to go through the book of psalms every month? Now, I flunk math, and I can do that. Britt, how many psalms do you have to read? Huh? How many psalms do you have to read to go through 150 psalms every 30 days? Huh? How about five? How many Proverbs are there in the book of the book of Proverbs in the Bible? Who? 31. How many days are there in most months? I just want to see if y'all are awake. All right, so if you read... Through Proverbs every month, you read a chapter a day. Proverbs basically tells you how to live with your fellow man and how to live on this earth the way we're supposed to live. So Mr. Graham has done that for years and years, and I started doing it, and I'd do it for six months, and then I'd quit. So there again, that's what I wanted the Lord was to give me, because it all gets down to what's in your heart. Discipline is great. A disciple is a disciplined person. And that's why I love the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. An athlete understands discipline. And back in my wide days, I could disciple an athlete much better than I could because if a person is not disciplined, it's just really tough going whether you're sitting here or whether you're sitting at a, out on a ball field. So anyway, ask the Lord to give you a desire for himself. And I want to tell you something, folks. If God doesn't answer that prayer, quit praying. Because he ain't going to answer any of the rest of them. Now, you just think as a father, if your child came to you, I just can't, my dad would have dropped dead of a heart attack. If I ever went to my dad and said, Dad, I don't want the car keys. I don't want my allowance increased. I don't want nothing from you. I simply want to be with you and to spend time with you. He would have flat died right there. Well, that's what your heavenly father is waiting on you to do, is to get to that point to where your desire is to be with him. It's the with him principle. Jesus called his disciples to be with him, to walk this, all over the country with him, to, to eat with him, to fellowship with him, watch him do miracles, etc. So they spent time with him, and if you don't spend time with God, it doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. And I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on you. I'm a grace man from start to go. But I just know how to change your life when God changed your heart toward him. Uh, this book on grace I'm going to leave here uh, for your library. And uh, to whet your appetite, Healing Grace.
Everybody here needs to be healed, either physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. When you're talking to somebody or listening to somebody, remember this. You're listening to somebody that's hurting. There's no such thing as a person that doesn't have pain going on in their life. So just remember that. And most of the time I find if I simply just take the time, whether it's on the telephone or whether it's on the beach this week at the campground, that's one of the things I love about camping. I have opportunities, and I'm dreading this week because I don't know how I'm going to do this social distancing and do my evangelism. I literally walk up and down the beach. I got a book in my hand. I got tracks in my pocket. And Franklin's book on uh, the prodigal, it's the easiest book in the world to start. It's not the best book you'll ever read, for sure. I tell Franklin all the time that. But anyway, it gives me a lot of mileage because I can walk up to somebody on the beach. In fact, I was taking a shower in the beach house last time I was just same place, and I had this book. I took it in. The, I didn't take it in the shower, but I took it in and laid it down where you put your clothes down. And I got ready to walk out, and I said, now, Lord, who am I supposed to give this book to? Well, this guy that works for the park had on his park uniform. He was cleaning, mopping, everything. And I said, I want to ask you something, mister. He looked at me. He thought I was going to complain about the shower wasn't clean. I said, have you ever been a prodigal? He said, yes. When I had said no, I would have said do you know any? And he'd have said, yeah, I got three kids and five grandkids. So it gets me into a conversation. Then I take Franklin's book on being a prodigal, and I say, I would like to give you this book. And I've never had a person yet that didn't say, well, thank you. I'll definitely need to read this book. Well, this, <laughs> this same guy, the next day I go to the same place, same shower, same time, and he walks up to me and he says, mister, I started reading that book, and he reaches in his uniform and he pulls out a $20 bill and he says I want to give you this for that book I said you can't do that you take my joy away he said what are you talking about I said the Lord has given me money to get these books and Christian literature I, I don't want to be paid for it and he said well if you take his $20 and on my behalf will you go buy some more books and give them away for me he just would not let me go without taking his money. So I said, okay, I did. I hope he shows up down here this year so I can give him another book. 1957 approximately, 57, 58, Dad was pastoring in Smyre, S-M-Y-R-E, North Carolina, which is a suburb of Gatonia, which is a mill village. And uh, that's where I graduated from high school. So I come home one day, as it happened about every four or five years, and there'd be a sign on the door saying, we've moved, see if you can find us. I always did by dinner time. And this sign said, we have moved to welcome. And I said, well, what's a joke? There ain't no such place as welcome. And so we moved 100 miles up the road from Smyre to welcome. Now, I finished high school and was getting ready to go to Asbury to college, and so I didn't get to spend a lot of time here, but... The church was being built, excuse me, it was very appropriately said, you are the church, we are the church, the church is the body of Christ, it's not a building, but this is the meeting house of the church. So over there's a part of that. And it was under construction, so I needed some money to go to school, so, you know, being the pastor, I guess my dad had enough influence to get me over there pushing wheelbarrows and mortar and brick up and down scaffolds while the church was being built and one of the people that I worked for was Raymond Wagner who's Britt's uncle right huh well anyways and, and then and Curry's your grandfather so I worked for those two guys and I shouldn't probably say this in church but some of the other people that I was working with had pretty foul mouths to say the least <laughs> this one guy he didn't think I was working hard enough and so he proceeded to call me some very unwelcome type names and and then I said something back to him and he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out a switchblade knife and flips it open he said I'll blanket blank you well either Raymond or Curry they picked up a trowel mortar trowel and said just Put that knife up or you're going to lose your head. 
<laughs> so, so that was a little thing on that church over there I never forgot. And I was also up on the top and looked out over the community and saw Bay Leonard in a terrible wreck up at uh, where they used to have their service station, their home across the street. So those were those were kind of interesting things that happened to me my first summer here, but it taught me a lot of things, and I got to meet some great people, and uh, I didn't have any idea at that particular time, you know, what was ahead of me, but let's see, you'd have to go about 20, 25 years forward, and uh, Franklin was graduating from Appalachian State, and like me, he had been in five or six colleges, and we had a lot in common. And so we became friends through his mother and so forth, and uh, two surgeon brothers. And then the third brother owns the 11 drug stores in the county. I'm not going to tell you how many Wendy's, but over 100. And so they're the ones who started... World Medical Mission, which is the medical arm of Samaritan's Purse. And they, these three brothers also ride Harleys. Well, as if you know anything about Franklin, he has ridden three times from Boone, North Carolina to Alaska, three times on a motorcycle. And these brothers have gone with him. So needless to say, that's, that's, I tell him, I said, Frank, if you love the Lord half as much as you love Harley Davidson's, you'd be a great preacher. But anyway, when we started the ministry, he said, okay, Ed, you've been working for my dad all these years. I don't have the foggiest idea what these guys have hired me to do, except I know they want to use my name to start an organization, and that's fine. They're paying me a decent salary, and so we give it a shot. But what do I do now? I said, Frank, you got to get out on the speaking circuit. you got to start raising money. And he just kind of looked at me and he said, where do I start? I said, well, you got to go to churches. So I said, I know one church I can get you in right now. He said, where is that? I said, down in Welcome, North Carolina. He said, where is that? And I said, that's where Dale Earnhardt's race car is. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're driving down here from Welcome. He said, when we get down to church, I want to look it over carefully. I said, well, Okay. So we went in the sanctuary there, and he said, okay, I want you to park the car right out there where that back door is. Because he says, when I finish whatever I'm going to do, he didn't say preaching. He said, when I finish speaking, I'm coming out that back door. You better be in the car, keys in the switch, and we're leaving. I said, no, we're not. He said, yes, we are. Well, I'm 15 years older than him. I'm not bigger than him. But I said, Franklin, you've got to... You got to be hospital people, socialize with people, shake hands with people. They ain't going to be interested in what you're doing. He said, I told you what we're going to do. Well, I said, I got the keys. You better catch me after church if you want to ride home. So I go right to the back of the church and I'm standing back there. So the church is over and he's just kind of up front. He didn't know which way to go. So I motioned to him. So he finally came back there and he said, okay, you stay right there. So <laughs> he stood there and shook hands and talked to people and he said can we go now i said yeah we're going to lunch with some people he said no we're not i said have you ever eaten lexington barbecue he said no and i ain't gonna start today and i said oh yes you are <laughs> so that this is where frank and graham so y'all won't take credit for launching him into his ministry it all started right here and i won't tell you it's the worst sermon i ever heard in my life and for the first two or three years, I set up a lot of his speaking engagements, places where I had already worked, and I had the mailing list and the telephone numbers. And I said, Frank, and you know, I'm not supposed to call or write anybody that I have any contact with in relationship to the work that I've done with your dad's organization. We sign a, a document saying we will not use this mailing list for any reasons other than a Billy Graham event. He looked at me and he said, that's my dad you're talking about. That don't mean me. I got out the contract and I said, well, let's see here. doesn't say Franklin Graham is exempt from this. <laughs> he said, I said, when you call your dad and I get permission, 
I, at that time, I had over 2,000 people on my mailing list. He said, when, you, when your dad gives me permission, then I will give you the mailing list. But I won't until then. So it, it, I knew it would happen, and it eventually did happen. So I would, I would call these people and churches and so forth and set up a meeting for Franklin. And it was a lot of fun, and I watched him grow, and I can't tell you how proud of Because Franklin was a real rebel when I met him. And uh, he was struggling with a lot of things in his life trying to find himself and uh, today he has three fine young men that i've spent more time camping with than i can remember about those boys wanted to camp i don't care rain snow sleet shine we were out at price lake on the parkway camping and it, their mother was so thankful for to get them out of the house and franklin was always gone so he said you know i'm, I'm sure god sent you here ed because my dad was gone all the time i said franklin wait a minute wait a minute my dad was gone all the time too I said, God gave you children, you're supposed to be their parent. And your dad has said many times there's two things that he'd change if he could live his life over. One, he'd get more education, he'd go to seminary. And the second thing is he'd spend more time at home. So I, I said, I'm not going to buy into helping you escape your responsibilities of being a father. So I take a little credit for pounding him on that time and time again. Well, I'm just delighted to say that today the three boys and his daughter all work in the ministry and they're doing a great job they're all married they have good marriages they got children some of them adopted children edward he's the youngest he went to uh west point and then um he's been 16 years in special forces he absolutely loved the military he married a general's daughter he was rooming with the uh, with the general's son at West Point, and he, Edward, you need to meet my sister, and so forth. And so anyway, he's militaries. And you know, when I take it, when I take the kids camping, he'd wear. When I mean, his kid was six years old. He'd wear an army uniform. I mean, he wanted to be military from the time. I don't know where he got it from, but anyway, six uh, after sixteen years. This past year, he told his dad. He said, Dad. I just think the Lord's telling me that I'm supposed to come and go to work with you. And, of course, his dad was elated. His general said, Franklin, you've just gotten your company. You've worked 16 years to get where you are today. You have got to be kidding to think about getting out now. And the general was a Christian, too. He said, listen, I don't want to get out. I want to stay and do. You've been in 36 years. That's my plan. I want to be a general. And the general said, well, you go pray about it some more, and I'll pray with you about it. And they did, and he just told, he said, look, I know I'm supposed to go to Samaritan's Purse. So anyway, he got out last year. He stayed in the, in the reserve, so he'll get some of his retirement. But he's just doing an outstanding job, and I think probably he'll be the one who will replace Franklin. He's, he's got just got a tremendous amount of ability. He's got a lot of presence about him. He's got a lot of speaking ability. And obviously, it don't get too rough for him to go to the places that Samaritan's Purse goes. Because as Franklin says, we don't run from trouble. We run to trouble in the name of Jesus. And Edward is, I think, going to do a great job at doing that. Okay. I've about used all my time. I'm either going to talk to you about Operation Andrew... Or I'm going to talk to you about prayer. Now, what I was going to speak about today was how to vote as a Christian. And I have a prayer group that I meet with every Wednesday, seven guys, for prayer. And they said, when I told them about this and asked for prayer, they said, well, okay, we'll pray that God will give you the message you're supposed to give. And one of them called me from Hilton Head and said, Ed, you're not supposed to talk about politics. I said, I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm going to talk about how Jesus would vote. He said, you're getting into politics. And I, he's my doctor of 40 years, Dr. Charlie Sykes. He said, well, I just don't think that's what the Lord wants you to talk about. And I said, okay. We've been praying together for eight or nine years, and I certainly have great confidence and respect to you guys as men of prayer. If you don't think I'll talk about politics, I won't talk about politics. But I will tell them this. I don't own any elephants or donkeys. I am a kingdom 
voter and I'm a member of the kingdom party. And that's is all I'm going to say about politics. Just pray and vote as God leads you. Study the issues and the platform, and, and I'm sure God will tell you how to vote. Andrew was one of the 12 disciples. And if I'd ask you to name the rest of them, I'll bet you everybody here, would the next disciple, who would it be? Who would you say? Exactly. Which is what I would have said. And one day a guy walked into my office at YMCA and said, Ed, why aren't you doing more evangelism? And I said, Ray, you got the wrong person. That's my brother. He's in the next office. Uh, my father was a pastor. I have several uncles that were pastors. I have family that are missionaries. I said, God didn't call me to be a preacher or an evangelist. And this guy looked at me and he said, but I tell you what he did call you to do. He called you to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And he said, I'm telling you that you do not have to have a calling as an evangelist or a pastor teacher to do the work of an evangelist, which Paul tells Timothy. In, in 2 Timothy 2, he says, Timothy, you're to do the work of an evangelist. Which is simply sharing your faith, living your faith. And if you don't live it, you're wasting your time sharing it. So anyway, this at this point in my life, I'd been at the Y about three years. And this guy, I'm sure God sent him to give me this lecture, which I really didn't want to hear. And he asked me that question. He said, uh, do you know who Andrew, the disciple Andrew? I said, well, I, I know. Yeah, I know he's a disciple. He said... Who's his brother? I said, well, Peter. And he said, and that's your problem. I said, what's my problem? He said, you're identifying with Peter instead of Andrew. And you know you can't live up to Peter, and so that's what you're using as an excuse to hide behind. And he said, now, do you know what Andrew did when he first met Jesus? And I did remember that from Sunday school. I said, Andrew went and got his brother, Peter, who was the leader of the family and the business. And he brought Peter to the master, to the Messiah, to Jesus. And he said, do you know when the next time we hear about Andrew? I said, I had a foggiest idea. He said, you remember the story of the little boy with the loaves and the fishes? I said, yeah. He said, Andrew's the one that found the little boy with the loaves and fishes and said, I want to take you to somebody that needs that food. So he said, the third and last time we hear about Andrew in the Bible, over in the 8th chapter of John, or 12th chapter, there's some Greeks that are inquiring about this miracle worker, this teacher that all the crowds are following. And Andrew said, I can't answer your questions, but I can take you to the person who can. So this Ray Harvey said, so tell me why you can't be an Andrew here where God's placed you to why. Well, I found out I could be, and, and that had a great impact on my life, and I've really never stopped. I just look for methodology that's comfortable for me with my spiritual giftings and my talents and what I do, and I try to always carry... This particular track is my favorite. It's called Steps to Peace with God, and I put enough of them back there for all of you to have one. And this, this track, hands down, because the Billy Graham organization developed it and has used it for 40 years, has been used to lead millions of people to Christ. And even if a person cannot read, it's laid out with, with diagrams and pictures so they can go through it and understand the plan of salvation without even reading. So I try to always leave either this or I got a lot of FCA tracks of Christian athletes and so forth, but when you're eating out or wherever you're leaving a tip, to me it's almost criminal not to leave the Word of God with your tip. Now don't leave the Word of God without a tip, but that's just one thing. Giving books away is another. UPS men or whoever delivery comes to my house, they know when they knock on the door, I'm going to be standing there with a book in my hand. 
and telling them, don't you come back by here till you read the first chapter. So I, I'm known as the book man. I've, I've got thousands of books, and I love to get people involved in reading good books. So anyway, that's, that's encourage you to share your faith as Andrew did, right where you are, right where you are where God has you for the time being, or you would not be there. God's a sovereign God. He's in charge of everything that happens to us. He's in control, so all he's asking is that we be seed sowers, we water, we plant, but guess who gives the increase? The Holy Spirit. We, we're not going to save anybody. All we got to do is to plant and water and then pray and trust God for the results. Every time you come to this church, you ought to invite somebody to come with you. And half the time when we go to church, they're feeding you. So that's another enticement sometimes to get people to come with you. But that is a good, that's the second question I ask anybody knocks on my door or I meet somebody. Uh, believe it or not, I had a haircut. If y'all, y'all, last time you saw me, my hair what, it's down to my shoulders. I hadn't had a haircut in four months because I didn't want to get COVID-19. And my wife says, well, you don't get a haircut, you're going to get something worse than COVID-19. So... I was talking to this lady who's cutting my hair uh, three or four days ago. And the second question I had, where do you go to church? Well, I don't go. Well, let me invite you to a great church that I promise you. I promise you, you will like it. And if you don't, I'll give you money back. And then they, you know, oh, yeah, okay. So bring people to church with you. Be a bringer. At least invite them. Try. You got a great church here with a great history of doing the Lord's work. And you got a lot going on here. And, and uh, it's just... It's just a great opportunity for us to do that. In closing, I told you about this book on grace. And I want to say about prayer a couple things. Reading is easy for me. I like it. I enjoy it. Studying the Bible, I like it. I enjoy it. I do not enjoy fasting and praying. To me... It's the hardest thing in the Christian life. Now, the older I get, it is getting a little easier. I used to ask my grandmother. I had the privilege of living with her for a while. She was in her 80s. She was all crippled up with rheumatoid arthritis. And one day we were getting ready to go to the doctor, and she was in a lot of pain. And I said, Granny, all your, most of your friends are in heaven. Your husband's in heaven. You've got more family and friends in heaven than you do here. Why are we going to the doctor? Why don't you just, this is coming from a 16-year-old. I said, I said, why don't you just die and go to heaven? <laughs> I said, that's all you talk about. She took it up her, she had, she's in a wheelchair, and she had this walking cane, and she picked up that walking cane, and she stamped about three hard things on this hardwood floor, and she said, Ed, I want to stay here and pray for my 39 grandchildren. She said, that is the only thing I live for. Well, that didn't mean a whole lot to me. It meant something, but now it means a heck of a lot to me because at that same grandmother's funeral over in West Market Street in Greensboro, North Carolina, at the Pilgrim Holiness Church, which you know nothing about. But anyway... The president of Asbury College was the speaker. And he, 39 grandchildren sitting in front of the casket. He looked at us and he said, I want to read a verse to you over in Revelation 6, 8. And it says something like this, paraphrased in the Living Bible. It says that the saints' prayers are bottled up as incense before the throne of God. And he said, your grandmother has been praying for you before you were born and praying for you all your life. And now you think that she's gone and you don't have her to pray for you. You're wrong. The prayers are there. All you got to do is ask and God will uncork the bottle and pour them out. Now, whether that's exactly what that verse means or not, I don't know. But it makes it makes a lot of sense to me that people. I tell you this. I'm not 100% sure that president of the college was right. I think he was. But here's what I am 100% sure of. In John 17, that's the high priestly prayer. 
The Lord's Prayer is over in Matthew 5 and in Luke 7 or 8, part of the Sermon on the Mount, Our Father who art in heaven. It's interesting, the disciples didn't ask Jesus to teach them how to preach, teach, do miracles, walk on water. The disciples said, teach us to pray. And I think the reason is that they knew that all the things that the Son of God was doing was a result of his time alone with God early in the morning. And all night long he prayed before he chose his 12 disciples. In fact, one day I was having a hard time putting a committee of people together for a Billy Graham event in Orlando, Florida. I could not get anybody. Nobody seemed to be interested. So I called Minneapolis to my supervisor and I said, skip Orlando. Go to, let's go to Miami or Jacksonville. I said, they ain't no pagans here. And he said, you can't skip Orlando. That's the third largest town. I said, we're going we gonna to have a crusade there. And I said, well, I can't find anybody to do the work. He got real quiet. His name was Mark Yeisley. He said, Ed, do you know what Jesus did before he chose his committee? I said, nope. He said he prayed all night. I said, well, I ain't Jesus. <laughs> but it did tell, speak very loudly to me that I hadn't spent enough time in prayer because I know now at 81 that God God hears all of our prayers he answers all of our prayers it may not be the way you want but he does and sometimes we won't know exactly uh, the answers to some of them till we get to heaven but what I was going to say is about my grandmother's prayers as incense before the throne of God as Revelation talks about John 17 says this Jesus told his disciples, I am praying for you, and I'm praying for those that come after you, and that would be us. So the greatest prayer partner we have is Jesus. Our high priest is at the right hand of God, interceding for us now. Now, folks, if that don't give you a certain amount of comfort, then your wood's wet or something. But that, just think about you have and I have Jesus as a prayer partner. <clears throat> now, being in a prayer group, uh, I don't know exactly how to say this. I started to say being in a small prayer group is more important than coming to 11 o'clock worship service. I, that's not true. But I do know this from, from a long time now of being with anywhere from five to a dozen people in a prayer group that it is probably the most important part of my week. And it motivates me to do the things that I'm supposed to do, like get more people to... The 11 o'clock worship service, let me tell you something. You're not going to get many of your non-Christian friends to come to prayer meeting on Wednesday night. I can promise you that. you got a lot better chance of getting them there on Sunday morning. And the best time you get non-Christian people to church is... Christmas, Easter, and picnic, homecoming. So that's the time to do evangelism. <laughs> In fact, when somebody told me that one time, he said, those are called CEP people, Christian CEP church members, Christmas, Easter, and picnic. And I told my dad that, and he said, well, I have another class of people, the FPO group. Funeral purpose only. <laughs> so, so that's kind of, I guess, the way you can size up a lot of people in this great country of ours that is a great country, has been a great country, and again, getting back a little bit on a political edge. On my answering, you call my phone, it says this. Before you leave a message, please listen to this message. Second Chronicles says... 714, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, repent, and turn back to me, I will heal their land. Now, that's what we got to do as Christ's body or your children and grandchildren are not going to live in a country anything like what we've lived in. We've had two great awakenings in this country and we, we're going to have to have a third great awakening. 
I mean, Billy Graham said many, many times, people tried to get him to run for being a senator in North Carolina, even run for president, and I think he could have probably been elected. He was never lower than 10 or 15 in, in any poll as being the most popular man in the country. He said, if I thought for one minute I could do more for this country in, in a political office versus what God's called me to do as an evangelist, I'd do it in a minute. But he said, America has a heart problem, and politics does not save heart problems. So, you know, it's hard to keep all that balanced. I'm not saying we're not supposed to be responsible, I'm not saying sort of we're not supposed to vote, et cetera. But I do know that the answer is a spiritual awakening. And with that, I want to close in prayer if you'll. Let's stand. <clears throat> Father, it's been uh, a blessing to be back uh, and welcome where uh, the Williams family has spent a lot of time and uh, got a lot of friends. Many of them now are with you, and we're thankful for that above all. That's where we're all headed, and uh, that is the great blessed hope that we look to. But anyway, thank you for this body. Of, of yours here that's serving you, that's ministering in this community along with other parts of your body and just help us to really realize that the best thing we can do for ourselves and for our families, for our community, for our nation is to come to your throne of grace as it says in Hebrews, to, we're, we're invited to come boldly but reverently and humbly to your throne of grace that we might obtain help in our time of need. So above all else, I pray that this group of people today, if they don't remember anything else, will remember from the great missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, who said this, prayer is the work. Everything else is the result. Amen. We've been so blessed to have Brother Eddie with us today, haven't we? Can we thank the Lord for him? I, I want to thank all of you for coming today. I want to remind you of the baptism today at 3.30. If you desire to be baptized by immersion, you, you, the address is... Printed. We'll also leave with buses as best we can, and we'll carpool. So hope you can come. Thank you all for coming today. God bless you. Thank you.